Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. As usual, I am Eric Sharayev, a professor who teaches the psychology class right now. And thank you to your dudes for providing opportunity to record this and save this. And uh, those of you who follow my lectures, remember we studied several subjects already and you're familiar with uh, consciousness and with sleep, uh, emotions, motivation. And now it's a subject of ser several lectures on human development. So we call it developmental psychology, the subject in psychology, the field in psychology, which studies human development. I will share my PowerPoint slides with you. I will explain key points about developmental psychology. I will talk about a little bit infancy and childhood as stages of life. Then I'll discuss the cognitive development of the child and infant, so development of the mind. Uh, and then we'll discuss some emotional developments uh, in the infancy and childhood. And so we'll give you an example of uh, psychological problems that occur during uh, early stages of life. And then in uh, later lectures, I will discuss uh, late childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and the process of aging and so, so many issues, interesting issues and problems and opportunities associated with uh, human development. Let me share screen with you and uh, let's begin. It will be about 30 minute uh, lecture, as you know. Uh, well, uh, this is uh, sort of a map of uh, uh, human development. A uh, map or a map that indicates a journey, and so I made it convenient for you to in, by indicating stages of human life. Developmental psychology is a field which studies uh, psychological processes of human development. It's about aging process, and we age since we're, we're born, infancy, first two years of our life, then childhood, approximately from uh, age two to 12, and early and middle stages of childhood, which we distinguish. Please understand that there's no exact uh, for to, to, well, to, to millisecond uh, division on stages. It's approximate. Approximate labels we give to different stages because they have different psychological features associated with, with stage. After that comes adolescence uh, periods, uh, approximately from uh, puberty. Uh, it's, a, it's a period of rapid psychological physical uh, development of, of a former child uh, to the formal age of adulthood, which approximately in most society cultures, 18, give or take a year or two. Adulthood uh, can be early uh, and middle adulthood and late adulthood, all those, uh, let's say, let's say just symbols or like a symbolic labels associated with our life. And I'll tell you later in my future lectures about why we talk about symbols, about early, middle, late stages and so forth. But this is a, a sort of a, a map, as I said, I recommend you to use, especially if you take exams. Uh, this is stage, uh, these are the stages which uh, are accepted by most psychologists in most countries in the world. This is how we see uh, developmental uh, process of human beings. Uh, the child who um, uh, is subject of our attention today is influenced by so many factors, but in, in fact, as we know, we studied them. It's a biological factors. Does everything matters in our biology now, in, in, well, in uh, the processes that are natural. Uh, and uh, this is about the brain, it's about the body, about metabolism, it's about height, it's about so many factors we call biological factors. It's also in, in family environment. Uh, it's uh, uh, conditions, the conditions in, within, the, within which the child uh, develops, uh, an absence of, of parents, presence of parents, their parenting style, siblings, the size of the family. Uh, well, whether they're cordial, emotional, and helpful, whether they're hostile or cold. So all those things matter. And so we'll provide some examples. We know about those examples, but I will give you some, I hope, interesting summaries. Uh, socioeconomic conditions also matter. Uh, the town, the village, the city in which the child grow, grows up, availability of funds, employment of parents, or whether they're un unemployed, gross power, hunger, starvation, luxury, uh, environment in which we grow up. Well, those conditions, conditions matter. And also culture. By culture, we mean overall lifestyle, style of, uh, of living. It's about thinking, it's about clothes, it's about food, it's about customs, it's about values, but many things we share together. And there's so many characteristics in each culture are similar. 
right? We respect honesty. We don't like uh, cruelty and unfairness. Just that so many things we share, but that certain specific details. Being more collectivist, being less collectivist, be, being more precision oriented, so more spontaneous. Being being we understand cultural differences, similarities, and we'll give you provide some examples uh, in the future. And I have provided in uh, previous lectures. All things matter, of course. Uh, prenatal. Uh, periods of, of life, psychologists don't spend, uh, uh, don't commit significant effort to this period. It's mostly for for uh, the fields of pediatrics to study this. Field. But we we know that it's a universal period which lasts approximately approximately 266 days in every ethnic, uh, racial, social group in in the world. During this period, we know, and psychologists know, just we get this data from doctors. Uh, those who study pediatrics and those who are pediatricians themselves, doctors and nurses and scientists, uh, that so many factors can negatively affect uh, our life, including poor nutrition, continuing stress of a mother, uh, substance use, not abuse, but just use. Uh, alcohol is a substance. Uh, well, I can say smoking, it's, 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 it's consuming substance. Smoke is a substance, vapor is a substance, absolutely. And uh, obviously, uh, uh, for substances such as heroin or cocaine uh, as a stimulant, well, they do affect the developing developing uh, child. The physical traumas that mother mother experiences, you know, from falls to to uh, extreme heat, extreme cold, and other other conditions. Only just four factors, four groups of factors are displayed there, but it could be more, way more, that's affect negatively a developing embryo in the fetus, that, that's so we always say, it's following doctor's advice, be very careful. It's a very important period of, of life. You'll notice continuing stress. So Luminous studies suggest that a stressful environment for a mother can negatively affect uh, the developing, developing child. The earliest stage of life, infancy, approximately two years. Why two years? Because uh, this is a period of total dependency of an infant. Uh, he or she are totally dependent. Uh, they, they can't walk, they can't uh, run, the kids even talk during this, this time. So mother, caregiver, father, other caregivers are essential for their development. In fact, human beings beat all the records uh, in, uh, well, the world of, uh, of uh, living, uh, living uh, organisms, uh, having this longest period of total dependency. dependency. But judge by, by yourself, it's very easy. But why two years? Because only by the end of second year, the child finally begin to walk independently, begin to run and run fast. Most of us, unless we have some physical conditions, of course, understand different differences in the way we, we grow up. Uh, the child is not able to speak yet. Uh, wait a minute, somebody said, I spoke at uh, 20th month. Yes, we can speak. We can use some words as early as, as one year, but they're just single words. We mention them. Uh, and so our speech, if it's developed before age two, is very, very, very uh, well uh, limited uh, to we use some words, maybe some verbs, maybe some adjectives, but we use them in single sentence, one word sentences. Age two means that we now begin to put those words together, begin to put them together and use uh, more uh, lengthy sentences and express our thoughts with two or three, three words. And also what's most important by age two, uh, it sounds a little bit strange for those who didn't study psychology, but here we begin to develop our self-consciousness, self-awareness. So we begin to be aware of our existence. We begin to be aware of the existence of others. And we understand by age two, begin to understand that that when we fall asleep, we wake up and we don't change. We remain the same, continued. Continue to those who are interested, check uh, my lecture on consciousness, on the consciousness we discussed this. So that's what infancy, first uh, first two years of life uh, from a psychological standpoint, the beginning of, uh, uh, end of infancy, beginning of uh, physical independence of a child, beginning of uh, own psychological quote unquote independence, so beginning to make our own judgments, have an our opinion, describe things, ask questions, say no and and say i want i don't want so the beginning of a period of of childhood but before that i must emphasize going back to importance of biological factors one simple example one example uh it's simple but it's profound uh neuroscience tells us that brain development promotes learning all well it's a 
so, such an obvious statement. Brain development promotes learning. Yeah, well, for, in, in which way? In the way that if we, if we uh, develop certain activities and we, we develop certain mental, physical activities in a child, it corresponds with engagement involvement on particular brain sets, paths. And so they, they develop and they, they are preserved. Those paths are preserved. See that the concept of synaptic pruning, synaptic connections in the brain that's frequently used are preserved. Those that are not are lost. In a simple way, yes, in, in quite often very complicated things supposed to be explained in a very simple way. In a simple way, those brain, brain, um, uh, paths, paths, pathways, uh, connections in the brain that are not engaged. They idle and they stay in the idle state, state, which is well, state of idling. Uh, and some connections can be lost. Those activities that we develop, uh, well, associated with the brain development and brain development associated with those activities. In other words, if you teach a child uh, to read at age three, she will start reading in most cases. If you don't teach her to read it, it until age three, she will not start reading before she's taught. Right? If you teach a child to play to play soccer, right, as they say, football in, in England or in Europe. So at age three, she or he will start playing football, soccer at age three or four or five, whenever you started teaching. So I understand, right? Some mothers say, well, geometry is something for school. Uh, my daughter will learn it at school. Once she goes to school, she learns about geometry. But try a little bit early, see? And, uh, well, geometry, playing music, recognizing voices of, uh, of, uh, of uh, different animals, sounds they make, and, and birds, and recognizing colors at age two, two and a half. No? So try, and then, which, which means that if we will teach this child, this, 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 fun, this uh, buildist, to a child, she or he are likely to develop those particular skills. What about overwhelming the child? That's a different question for a different topic for us to, to consider, consider. So um, in um, infancy, uh, children uh, already uh, uh, learn things, of course, and then uh, parents and caregivers are crucial in this learning um, uh, environment, but also don't forget that many uh, functions that we perform uh, cognitive, emotional, have been, how to say it, installed in us already. We have them ready. This is a phenomenon which is described in so many textbooks, probably in every textbook. Uh, it's a famous experiments about, about a, a visual cliff. So uh, when the child is shown, uh, see the surface, looks like a, there is a cliff right there and the child can fall, but it's very safe. Very thick glass and child can try. She or he will not fall down, but they are very cautious about it. In other words, this experiment showed that uh, in many ways our brain brains are ready to provide us with uh, very useful behaviors, or at least at least at least uh, well direct us to perform or not to perform particular behaviors, even though the child doesn't have any experience with cliffs or with high places, not yet. And still, we are very careful, very cautious. In other words, so uh, this these experiments show that uh, some activities in us can be pre-installed. Doesn't mean that so we're given wisdom and math skills right away and we can just know the calculus at age three. No, not at all. Uh, however, it's many physical and cognitive skills that we have, or abilities rather, uh, can be pre-installed in us early uh, in life. But also my previous example about the brain, synaptic brain suggests that if we develop particular functions, they are likely to develop in the infant in a child. Childhood lasts from uh, two to approximately 11 and 12. In my next lecture, we'll discuss adolescence and I'll tell you why 12 is a, a cutoff time. Uh, this is a, a wonderful period of our development when we develop language, thinking, cultural identity, learn basic social skills uh, and uh, basic social skills about so uh, how to behave, what to say, what not to say, how to restrain yourself, how to uh, uh, make commitment, how to sustain your efforts, and how to uh, sometimes, uh, well, uh, take advantage of a situation, how to manipulate other people. Yes, yes, we learn a lot. So great skills and skills, which uh, we may consider not necessarily appropriate. 
right? We'll learn about them too uh, during uh, infancy begin, but uh, then continue during uh, our uh, during childhood period. I um, uh, also emphasize the importance of early communication with infant and with a, with a child. Returning to example, um, uh, it's uh, it's about languages, it's about basic social skills, basic intellectual skills. Um, I have been and I am a big fan of early child uh, engagement. I uh, argue, it's a friendly argument uh, with uh, many parents, some parents who say that, uh, well, I can uh, overwhelm my daughter, my son by teaching so many things. Let them be, let them have great uh, carefree childhood. They'll go to school, they'll learn the math and reading and writing, which is fine, a concept. Yes, if a child doesn't read and write by age five and six, it's not a big deal in many ways. She will learn, he will learn and will catch up, but it may take longer to catch up with others. It's also about self-esteem. It's also about comparing yourself to others. I'm five, I can't read yet, and everybody reads in the, my classroom. So it's a social, social interaction means it's how people see you. But also, uh, I, I repeat myself that that's the early child, the child develops particular skills, say cognitive skills, the better for him or her to learn school curriculum, to understand more difficult things, to understand more advanced things. So uh, in, not in every case, but in most cases, if a child is ready, if a child is, has, has been uh, taught how to develop the skills uh, and uh, habits, so it will be easier for him or her to move forward, advance other skills. So it's sort of a step forward on the path of a child's success at, at school. Uh, this is my, my talk, right? You say, how about, how about psychological experiments? Only one example I give it to you, only one. There are many of them in books and, uh, and uh, in uh, lectures, but Jean Piaget, that's a, a professor whose name appears in every psychology textbook, whose research either conducted in, a, well, on the 20, in the 20th century, a long time ago, his research found significant support across the world, Latin America, Africa, Asia, Europe, all over the world, because his studies are, well, quite, quite, I would say, cross-cultural in, in, in their significance and the replicability, so they were repeated in other countries. He suggested uh, that uh, well, human beings are, uh, children develop uh, their cognitive skills in stages, in stages, and uh, it's not our, uh, will or our desire to move forward from stages. No, this is how the nature unfolds. Jean Piaget himself was biologist by training. And so it, it, it shows, right? It's, uh, his idea was uh, approximately just that, that the nature prepares, prepared us to move from stage to stage. And on each stage, we develop particular skills. For example, first stage, sensory motor stage. Infants learn about the interaction with the immediate environment. So this is something they can grab, something they can see, something they can taste. That's the environment. And here, that, that's the state, the world is the world of manipulation. They, they can touch uh, and if you can try something, can sniff something, lick something. So this is what the environment is, is all about, it's sensory, sensory motor. Uh, they are in a constant uh, process of, uh, of repetition of things. So it's, uh, uh, it's a constant process, process of, uh, well, this, this uh, well, uh, circular movement, as we say, playing with a toy, shaking, 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 shaking uh, uh, to annoy neighbors and fam some family members. Uh, well, uh, looking at, at the picture and giggling uh, once, twice, three times, 15 times, 100 times. So it's a circular development. So the kids need to repeat things and we as parents need to help them in this repetition, circular movement, as we say. Uh, second stage, I will call pre-operational stage. This is again preschool period. Uh, child develop a foundation of language acquisition. So, and uh, and uh, learn a basic structure of, of a language or languages which child speaks. Child speaks. Uh, and here also is understanding the, the the grammar structure language, and also uh, here. Uh, is the period when the child learns to, to understand its own existence, however, has difficulty understanding the other points, people's points of view. We call, uh, call it egocentrism. It's not about being egotistic and nasty. No, it's, it has some, 
validity, but uh, egocentrism um, in child psychology means the stage when the child believes that she is, he is in the center of the universe. And in, in many ways they are, they are. But uh, it also means that it's difficult for them to understand uh, other child's standpoint, other person's standpoint, uh, difficult to understand self from the outside world. Right, that's just called egocentrism. Uh, it's emotional, it's cognitive in so many ways. It's it's um, placing self in the center of universe. And the third stage, concrete operations. So, so mostly, mostly preschool, the beginning of early schooling, schooling, formal schooling of a child. Here, a child learns uh, the uh, and logic of uh, volume, amount, and weight, uh, and uh, they understand the meaning of uh, uh, those uh, uh, those. Uh, uh, terms and uh, this is uh, something which I can show it to you uh, in those experiments. Uh, it's been done in a, in a more neat way, but well, essentially, for we show this for four-year-old and say, well, uh, you see this piece of paper, uh, you can touch it to see, uh, and is it heavy? And child said, no, it's not. But how about this piece of paper? Uh, we'll we'll make it make a, a paper ball. Is, is it heavier than the piece of paper? Yes, child, yeah, it's heavier. It's heavier than this piece of paper. And the child said, yeah, the paper ball uh, was heavier than the piece of paper. But you ask, how about it's the same piece of paper? No, because you smooshed it and it's heavier right now. See, that's the interesting uh, 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 mechanism or the function of our brain. So we confuse the volume, the size, uh, and the numbers still, still, and then take some time to learn uh, things that things cannot disappear in thin air. Things must exist in different forms and sometimes don't lose the uh, volume and weight uh, despite the change of physical appearance. We call the process a conservation, so concrete operations. And finally, the child developed formal operations. When, well, it depends, but usually it's the first elements of formal. Uh, operations appear uh, seven, eight, just first elements, but then uh, age 10, 11, 12, then a child understand the formal language, meaning understand symbols and what they mean and abstract terms. And then, then moves, moves on and on and on. But don't um, uh, get my words literally, many of us adults have difficulty uh, using formal operations, uh, and we prefer to get specific examples instead of uh, describing things in general. And many young kids can use formal operations, but usually just uh, just uh, in some cases. Of course, it comes with the development of brain and development experience of a child by age 12. But remember, Piaget suggested, this is the well law of nature, this is how nature moves. We can also can make some changes through education, but that's basically how far we can go with, uh, with our development. Uh, there are others, and I would like to, make, to mention the name of Lev Bugatsky. Uh, Lev, L-E-V, it's his uh, first name. Leo, Lev, a Russian uh, uh, born psychologist who died, very young man, uh, was almost forgotten. And then his works were rediscovered, translated into English and Spanish and Chinese and other languages. And he was sort of rediscovered by scientists. Um, he, in his experiment, showed, uh, and he developed the concept of a zone of proximal development, zone of proximal development, suggesting that, yes, the child moves from, from stage to stage based, based on probably natural uh, laws of development. However, if you, if you push the child a little bit further, if you stimulate the child, if you encourage the child, if you reward the child to learn, he or she will learn more. Not definitely don't try just to teach calculus to a three-year-old. Don't try to, to teach trigonometry to a six-year-old. They will not understand that yet. But a little bit more every day, every hour, every week, and you see the child will, will develop because we have this zone of proximal development, as I show you this in this in this slide. This slide. In, in general terms, you see the uh, sort of a uh, uh, slide I designed for you. So, uh, it shows the uh, differences between Piaget and Vygotsky, the two points of view in developmental psychology, which complement each other. But see, Piaget was mostly on uh, this predetermination. This is how we're supposed to be done. How things are supposed to be done is how we're supposed to do. Vygotsky was more, uh, more on improvement, uh, into improvement, into self-development, into self 
uh, self uh, embitterment in so many ways. So for instance, uh, here we go, uh, we learn words at age one and two, then sentences from three to five, and then we can use narrative short stories. Uh, age seven, then complex narratives, so it's age 10, 12, 15, and then develop uh, ideas of, of abstract ideas and use sarcasm, and then understand calculus. And so this is the seed that says sort of an age uh, development and some particular skill developments correspond to uh, this, this diagram. But Vygotsky said we can do more. We can do more. Uh, and that if parents, if they have time, skill, and knowledge, they can uh, push the child uh, and give them more, and child will learn more. Whether or not uh, you should do this if you become a parent, uh, or if, if you're a teacher, will you uh, support Vygotsky or Piaget? It's definitely a matter of personal choice, of course, historical, social perspective, how you see development of a child, how you see the function of a family, function of a school. What do we do? Just we simply give children what we think they have to get or what we think they can achieve. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, it's a comp complex, complex question. It's again, as I said, a social question. It's, you know, it's individual choice about how far you push the child and how gently push the child to develop his or her skills. But child development is not only about math and algebra and uh, writing narratives. It's also about emotional development. So I'll give you only one example uh, about emotional development. Um, uh, one example among hundreds I could have given to you. And here we go, it's a very short piece on attachment. Uh, attachment is uh, not an, an, it's not an emotion, it's a process, it's an emotional bond, a uh, tie between individual and attachment figure. So it's emotional, emotional connectivity, emotional bond. It's, it's invisible, of course, it's not something feasible. Uh, parents and children, siblings and, and siblings, friends and friends, and so, um, and um, uh, studies in psychology, and there's been a lot of studies, have been many, many studies conducted since uh, middle of 20th century, uh, when the studies began. Uh, they, uh, this study showed that our basic uh, individual features, who we are, how we see the world, how we develop this world, how we um, love and how we dislike, how we pursue our goals, or many of, of those functions develop on the type of attachment we develop. The type of attachment we develop early in our life, usually in our families, the type of attachment we develop there will significantly affect your attachments uh, as an adult. In other words, uh, those of you who are 20, 25 at this moment, or 30, so the type of your French that you have right now, the type of your attachment, so your love in your French, so resembles, it's supposed to resemble the type of attachment you develop as a child. Doesn't mean it should be identical, we do change, but lots of connectivity between the way you've been treated in the past as a child, the way you saw the world and, and uh, your attachment figures as a five-year-old, six-year-old, year old boy. So that way, that style of attachment is likely to resemble uh, who you are today, likely to resemble. Interesting, right? Just check it and get back to me if you can, just to just say, oh, well, you're right, professor, you don't, you don't, you don't. So in other words, if you were capricious, if you were not really trustful, if you were uh, abused a lot as a child, emotionally, uh, there's a high probability that you are, uh, we tend to be capricious, tend to be uh, bitter, tend to be inconsistent today, today. High probability, I'm not saying you, you should, you're supposed to be this way. In psychology, we distinguish many types of attachment. I use this classification, which is most common secure attachment type, so we're somewhere in, in, in the middle. So we, we're comfortable with others, we are sad when the friends uh, leave us, uh, we trust, but sometimes we um, understand that trust has limits. Uh, we have confidence in most people, not but in all people. We can spend some time alone, but not all the time. So this is a cool secure attachment type. It's, it's relatively healthy, a healthy type. Uh, uh, AAA, anxious ambivalent attachment type, Anxious as an adjective stands for anxiety, ambivalent both ways, okay, coexisting. Anxious ambivalent is, uh, is a roller coaster. Uh, the child wants to be with someone, but uh, not too close to it. Uh, child really wants to trust and confide in somebody, but uh, cannot do so. 
uh, child of real love uh, have many friends and then the next morning just doesn't like this. So the child doesn't really want to be alone, but uh, does almost everything to be alone, right? So jealousy, emotional highs and lows. So it's a, it's a difficult type of attachment, but look around you, look at your friends, look at your family members, and fine, you find one or two or even more people who do have this anxious and ambivalent style of relationship. Sometimes you wonder, what did I do to deserve such a treatment from my friend? It's always up and down, up and down. Maybe it's my fault. Quite often, it's not your fault. Quite often, it's some person has this style of, of attachment to you. And this is the style which doesn't change uh, well, over a month or a year. It's, it's something which, which stays with us, with us for, for substantial periods and very much uh, stable and may not even change for many years. And finally, uh, avoiding attachment type. Avoiding attachment type, uh, I think the name tells everything. Avoiding behavior. So the child feels discomfort in being close to others, prefers to be alone, and remains distrustful, especially to outsiders. So, um, and uh, interesting, the child, and then later an adult, doesn't uh, have uh, fun, <laughs> is afraid uh, to uh, become emotionally attached to another person. So for the fear, for many fears exist, but the person doesn't feel comfortable to be uh, attached to somebody because it, it depends, it depends. I hear a lot from, from um, others saying, well, how come Professor I, uh, well, tell told everything to my friend and uh, I open up my soul to, to her and she, she's, she's not responsive. She just doesn't want to tell me anything about her. Like an iceberg, I see on the tip of the iceberg and the most 90% of it underneath the water. So that could be it could be a style of attachment. It's not about you, it's not about person being manipulative, not necessarily. It's about the, well, the person's tip um, on discomfort when she or he feels uh, to disclose self. Disclosure means dependency for them. They don't want to be dependent. They want to avoid this. Um, usually some abuse in the past could be there. Uh, some emotional trauma could be a, 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 could be a reason for, for that. But also this is type of, uh, uh, well, our nervous system and our brain work. So we are, many of us are born with a certain st style of, uh, uh, of response uh, to the world. And this style of response translates into uh, avoidance attachment type. But please notice, neither anxious ambivalence uh, type uh, nor avoidance are uh, disorders. There can be problems, but these are our styles, of individual styles. Can they be helpful in our lives? Maybe, maybe. Um, well, who knows? Uh, if you're a poet, if you're a musician, if you're an engineer, uh, well, maybe some of your attachment style could be uh, helpful in your professional activities, in your personal life. But usually not. Usually not. Usually they generate more problems in us, and we we seek advice, help, or don't don't feel comfortable having those type of relationship that we have. But remember, so the type of, of attachment we keep as as adults uh, is heavily rooted in the type of attachment we develop as children. And finally, I mentioned about psychological problems, disorders. We recognize, I'll give you one example of a uh, type of a emotional uh, problem could be disorder, uh, uh, which we uh, we recognize in children and call attachment anxiety. We also know it as separation anxiety, but also be separation anxiety disorder if it's uh, if it's really really uh, out of proportion, uh, out of. Uh, uh, norm, uh, it's it's uh, abnormal, it's distressful, and also dysfunctional. Well, so the symptoms uh, can uh, be traced in, say, in the child, and they must be observed for significant periods. So at least, at least, I'd say, like this context, at least uh, several months of, of observations, not only one week of behavior of a child. See, um, recurrent or excessive distress when a separation occurs or anticipated. So parents want to leave, go to movies, and. Um, and so uh, the child really screams and child doesn't want them to go and she's five and she doesn't want parents to leave. Well, it's just a really quick. Five-year-old supposed to stay with the grandparents or with the babysitter uh, and so, or with his older sibling. So, but so here is not that the case, consistently not the case. Uh, persistent, excessive worry about possible harm uh, to person of attachment. So it's really, uh, uh, 
<laughs> of really irrational. So, mommy, don't go to work. I'm afraid you you will never come back home. Really, really, really inappropriate, right? But so, mother is distressed. How can I leave if my child really thinks that I will not be able to be, be back home? So I'll disappear somewhere. Uh, persistent refusal to perform certain activities because of uh, fear of separation. Like what activities? Going to, to, to kindergarten, going to school. Every mother, every teacher, well, most of us as parents know that the kids, especially going for the first time, uh, daycare or kindergarten, uh, first grade, they, it's not a, the, maybe the most exciting day. It's, it's anxious and nervous, lots of uh, tears <laughs> right there. Mommy, I want to go home. We know this. Uh, uh, but most kids are fine. Second, third, fourth day, life is, is good. Here, the child refuses to spend uh, even a half hour of babysitting, uh, going to school, or be dropped off by, by grandparents' place and doesn't want to be with them. Uh, repeat nightmares involving a the theme of separation. Uh, not just, uh, uh, just nightmares, could be night terrors. The child cries, the child refuses to, to fall asleep because say, mommy, I, I can't fall asleep because I'm afraid of, of uh, well, you lose me again in the shopping mall, something like that. So repeated nightmares involving the theme of separation. And also complaints of physical symptoms, headaches, abdominal pain, even vomiting. Upset stomach, yes, when separation from major figure uh, is anticipated or, or uh, occurs. So it's a physical reaction, which is definitely based on, on initial anxiety symptoms. And uh, uh, yes, some children even, uh, well, I don't think they learn it, but uh, the reaction occurs uh, and it's, it's a very strong signal to parents don't leave. So if, if a daughter complains about stomach ache, uh, if son all of a sudden throws up, I'm sorry about this, but uh, when you say, well, we go to see, uh, we go to, to, to the movies, for instance, so we'll go to see our friends for a party. Uh, and so, so everything and uh, here, this must be consistent, observed for several months, uh, and uh, really, really affects the child life, the child's life, life of parents that we can qualify it as a separation anxiety disorder. But this is something that must be uh, established by a licensed professional in the United States, must be a licensed, qualified professional to diagnose separation anxiety disorder. But in the milder forms, we can call separation anxiety. Most kids go through this period of life um, without you know, significant uh, impact on, on their life. But in, if it happens and happens for it continues for many months, this is this uh, probably requires the attention of psychologists. It's, it's a mild problem, but psychologist uh, is qualified to help. Well, during uh, this very short lecture, I was able to discuss uh, with you just a, a only a few stages of individual development. We talked about infancy and childhood today. Uh, and uh, as always, you can take a look at uh, samples of questions uh, that will appear and uh, can accompany the lecture. Uh, you can practice uh, your, your knowledge. Uh, next time, we will study adolescence uh, before we turn to adulthood and late adulthood in a series of lectures about uh, developmental psychology. Thank you. That was uh, Dr. Eric Shrive. Thank you to the dudes for providing time, opportunity to record this lecture. See you later. Thank you.